Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, especially as you begin this season of, of Lent together, uh, which is, as Phil's indicating, is not just a thing for our church or our churches. That is a, a season for the global church around the world to go into. And if you're new to the season of Lent, essentially Lent is a season in which the global church kind of intentionally makes its way in worship and prayer and reflection towards Easter. And the kind of, I guess, the pinnacle and the core of our faith. And Lent is a time for, for worship, it's a time for reflection, um, and it's a time to consider not just whether we simply believe in the person and work of Jesus, but whether we are following after Jesus. It's a time to actually ask some of those questions in terms of, how am I doing? Am I following Jesus as well as believing in him? And if you're here this morning thinking, I'm not sure I, I do believe in him at all, then I hope you know how, how welcome you are. And actually, this could be a good season for you to go on that same journey of wondering about what it might mean to both believe in and follow Christ. And because of that, um, sometimes Lent includes a season of prayer and of fasting. I don't know how you feel about the latter of those two things, or both of those two things, but it, they do often characterize Lent. And I suspect that's why Phil, along with lots of ministers and pastors around the world, suggested Matthew 4 as this morning's text, because Jesus does some of that uh, prayer and fasting. Um, so if you have your Bibles, do turn, not actually to Matthew 4 quite yet, but to Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, because we'll start in Hebrews, and then we'll get into the main text, which is in Matthew's Gospel. Um, forgive me, we, we use the ESV translation, I think you use the NIV translation, both are brilliant, but that's why there might be some slight um, differences with what you see on the screen to what you see in your, in your Bible. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, this is what uh, the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which cling so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God." There are many glorious things you could say about a text like this. I'll just say one thing, and it's this. Although Jesus has defeated, if you like, the penalty of sin and shame at the cross, the presence of sin, the writer says, can still cling, is the word he uses, or maybe entangle is another, how another translation puts to it. It can still cling to us. It can still weigh us down, a bit like wearing something heavy on a race is the metaphor that he's, that he's using. Um, this is a relatively heavy backpack. Can you just verify that it's quite a heavy backpack, Helen? Oh, yes. Mighty woman though you are, you wouldn't appreciate yes. wearing that on your back whilst you were running a race. And that, I think is the kind of thing the writer of Hebrews is trying to get to, is that for some of us, we can end up wearing things like this. It's not to do whether you're saved or not. When you become a Christian through faith in Christ, you're made completely new, perfect, salvation secured. But the writer is talking to Christians, and he's saying it's possible for sin to kind of cling to us and weigh us down in our race. And I'm guessing, unless there are any kind of SAS commandos here who seem to, have a, who seem to revel in like getting the biggest, heaviest pack they can to go running with, most of us would prefer not to run with a pack like this. And I want to tell you this morning, just having been praying this week, I sense the heart of God is to remind us this morning, when, as a follower of Jesus, his heart for you is that you and I would run and that we would run free. His heart for us is not that we would get used to certain things that weigh us down and slightly hobble or limp our way through the Christian life. He loves you far too much for that. His heart for you, his heart for me, is that we would run, not free of hardship, because the writer of Hebrews says that it, this race requires endurance. But his heart is that we would run free of sin and its ability to weigh us down, to control us, and to hinder us from being all that God the Father has got for us. And I know you're spending this year thinking and praying and dreaming into what it might be to be a church of hope this year, which is a brilliant thing to be praying into. A church where you know hope in Jesus. A church where you show hope to each other, right? 
and a church where you share hope to the people of Hersham and beyond. That is a brilliant thing to be praying into and dreaming for this year. I want to commend Phil and Heather for leading you into that. Go with them. Run hard after them. Because that is an eminently biblical, missional thing to be uh, wanting to be a church of hope. And I think this, this morning, Jesus is here to bring hope. Fresh hope. Because if you're anything like me, we can just feel like sometimes there are just things that are oh, just kind of how I am. That's just the way I think. It's just the thing that I always stumble with. It's just a part of my character that kind of lets me down or just sometimes hurts other people. I think Jesus wants to bring hope this morning. That actually, he's going to help you this morning to lay some stuff aside and to run free. I know Phil is big into his lunchtime summaries. So I have been very obedient. And actually, it's very helpful to crystallize this message. Because I want you, I know we're the best one in the world. Come Thursday morning, you ain't going to remember all 25 minutes of this. But I trust you will remember this. The message, the heart of the message this morning is that the way to live free is to know your enemy, know yourself, and know Christ. Okay? The way to live free from sin is to know your enemy, know yourself, and know Christ. And we're going to go into Matthew 4, and we're going to see how Jesus does it himself and how he does it also for us. Okay? So Matthew 4 and verse 1. Again, forgive the slight translation differences. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. One of the bigger understatements in Scripture, I suspect that one. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The way to live free is to know your enemy, know yourself, and know Christ. And at the end of this message, we'll have a chance to respond and, and pray with each other so we can all leave that door more free than we came in. There is a, a Chinese military general back in the third and the fourth century BC who wrote, I'm told, an influential book on military strategy. His name was Sun Tzu. And he said this. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So, number one, know your enemy. Know your enemy. If you want to double click on that, know your enemy's existence and know his tactics. And then, if you've seen the kind of cult movie, The Usual Suspects, um, and in that, there's a line in that movie that stole uh, the, the, the quote of a 19th century French writer and it popularized it brilliantly. And the French writer and then the actor in the movie said this The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And I think he's onto something. You know, we look, we look around the world and we can see the reality of evil. It's clear to all of us, whatever our worldview might be. And scripture tells us that evil does have a name. Satan, or the devil, is how Matthew and Jesus refer to him in this passage. In John 10, Jesus calls him the thief. And not just the thief who might nick some of your stuff. Jesus calls him the thief, quotes John 10.10, 10, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
That's the reality of the enemy that we have. Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. So question, to what extent are you mindful that you have an enemy? He hates Jesus, he hates the church, and he hates Jesus' followers. And guys, this is not about going all weird and, and giving the devil far too much airtime. but if your church is anything like us, I suspect that probably isn't your vulnerability. If your church is anything like us, it's probably actually where we don't give enough attention to the existence of an enemy. It's about us being switched on. And uh, Terry Virgo, who kind of originally founded, I guess, the New Frontiers family of churches, of which New Ground is a part, uh, he always used to say, the Christian life is not like a battle, it is a battle. So I've always found very helpful to know your enemy's existence. And secondly, know his tactics. Know his tactics. Elsewhere in Scripture, in John 8, 44, Jesus calls the devil the father of lies. Which I think gives us a pretty good clue as to his main tactics. He lies. And in simple terms, he lies about who God is, and he lies about who you are. Those are his two favorite lies. Who God is, and who you are. And his first lie, in Genesis 3, verse 1, what did he say? He said to the first people, did God really say? <laughs> Straight away, lying about who God is. And here in this passage in Matthew 4, again, he's twisting the word of God, misrepresenting God, misapplying scripture, misrepresenting the heart of God. He lies about who God is. Is God really good? That's one of his favorite ones for us. Do you think he really hears your prayers? Doesn't seem like it. Not getting many answers here. That's one of his favorites. And he lies about who we are. And he does it to Jesus. So folks, if he, lie, if he tries to lie to Jesus about who Jesus is, rest assured he'll try that one on us. Do you see it? Verse 3 and verse 6. If you are the Son of God. What do you mean if? If you are the Son of God. Are you sure, Jesus? Because you're pretty hungry. It's an identity lie. Are you sure you are who you really are? He does it to Jesus, he'll do it to you and I. You? Christian? I, I saw your week last week. You? Loved by God, are you sure? All the time? Unconditionally? Because you're in Christ. He loves to lie about who God is and who you are. He doesn't need to send a whole pack of demons running down the aisle here. It's far too subtle for that. Just needs to keep dropping in lies about who God is and who you are. Are we discerning that? Are we resisting that? Let me just give you a silly illustration. Um, I only have analogies about war and sport, as you're about to find out. This one's sport. Um, I used to play rugby a number of years ago, and I was, I was playing a game of rugby, and if you know rugby at all, I was the guy playing fly half. And that just means you're the first one to catch it after it's been passed out of the scrum. Are you with me? To, uh, enough. Okay, just about. And uh, we were winning this game fairly, fairly comfortably. And uh, I, was, I was unusually playing relatively well and starting to feel quite confident, maybe even overconfident. And as the ball came out to me from the back of the scrum, rather than passing it like I should have been doing and, was, and that was being pro proving quite effective, I thought, maybe it's my turn for a bit of a run. Maybe it's my turn for a few tries. So rather than passing the ball, I turned my attention this way to start making a bit of a run and smash! Ball went up in the air, gum shield flew out, front flack on my back, and I got absolutely cleaned out by this guy two or three times the size of me. And as I was checking for my ribs and wondering where my gum shield had gone and feeling fairly stupid, it dawned on me, or at least it dawned on me this week as I reflected on it, that I had forgotten I had an enemy. We were winning, but I'd forgotten on the opponent's team as a guy that wears number seven on his shirt. And his, basically his reason for existing is to try and take out people like me, the number 10. That's what the number 7 does. And just because we were winning, I'd forgotten that was still his job. And actually, I suspect because we were winning, he was all the more keen to take me out. I'd forgotten I had an enemy. And secondly, because this is about knowing your enemy and knowing yourself, I'd also forgotten my own weakness. I'd forgotten that I was comfortably, as I always was, the smallest and weakest player on the team. I was always smaller than everybody else. I was not designed to be running through great big forwards. I was designed to catch and pass. I'd forgotten I had an enemy, and I'd forgotten my weaknesses. And what's the big idea this morning? That to run free, we need to know we have an enemy, 
And we need to know ourself as well as knowing Christ. So number two, know yourself. Know yourself. Know your weaknesses as well as your identity. And I think it's wise, just wise living to be sober-minded, biblical living to be sober-minded. And the reality is, as we follow Jesus on this race that he's marked out for us, our identity doesn't always yet fit in line with how we act. In other words, who we are doesn't always, or how we live doesn't always sit in line with who we are. So scripture says that we are perfect. If you follow Jesus, you'll be made perfect, completely clean, blemish-free, spotless in the sight of God. And scripture also says we are being perfected. There's a reality to our identity, and there's a reality to the process in which we come to live in the good of that. We have weaknesses. Could you just nod if it's just not just me has weaknesses? Hey, really, it's just me. Okay, phew. Some of us have weaknesses and vulnerabilities. We're still fallible. And Jesus, in his humanity, had vulnerabilities in this text. He was very hungry, and I suspect very tired. And so sure enough, the enemy comes straight in around bread. And Jesus knew that vulnerability and he was ready to resist. He was ready to answer. And as the enemy goes on, he probes to see whether there's any pride or lust for power in Christ. And he's ready to resist that. Are you? Is the question. Do you know your enemy, his existence and his tactics? And do you know, in a sober-minded way, where you're vulnerable? Because if you do, unlike me on the rugby field, you'll be ready to fend off and resist the enemy, rather than finding yourself flat on your back. And Lent is a season for self-examination, to some sense. It's partly why Christians enter into it. Not in a heavy way to beat ourselves up, anything like that, but actually just to begin to see, to what extent is my heart clean and pure, and am I living and running free? There are worse prayers to pray then Psalm 139, 23, 24. It's not on the screen. I'll read it to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's a wonderful thing to pray. He didn't say, oh Lord, would you show me where I'm a total failure? <laughs> he said, God, I want to stand authentic and humble before you. I want to be the person you've made and saved me to be. So show me where I'm stumbling and limping so that I can know life everlasting. See that? Self-examination followed by possibly confession and repentance is where life can be found. Know your, know your enemy, know yourself, your weaknesses, and your identity. And your identity. If you know your Bible, in the previous chapter, Jesus has just been baptized. And it is this wonderful moment of identity affirmation. Matthew 3, 17. The Holy Spirit comes and rests on Christ in the water. And the Father speaks over him these amazing words. Many of you will know them. God says over the Son, Hey, this... It doesn't say hey, sorry. This is my Son, whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. And isn't it interesting that the first thing the devil does is question exactly that. If you are the Son of God, he says a few verses later. And Jesus resists that because he's utterly secure in who he is. He knows. He knows who he is. He gives the devil no foothold with that identity lie, takes the accusation captive, and sends it packing with the word of God. No, it is written. It is written. It is written. Do you know who you are? If you're a follower of Jesus, do you know who you are? Do you take time to renew your mind with the truths of who you are? Listen, in this culture of ours, of which there are many good and beautiful things, one of the broken things I would suggest in our culture is that we are encouraged, commanded I would even say, to discover our identity, our authentic self, by looking within. That is the message, if you haven't clocked it by now, that we're being preached over and over and over again. In here, how you feel, that's where you'll discover your authentic self. Actualize that to know your identity. Now, we don't, we don't ignore how we feel. We don't need to be ashamed of, of how we feel. But actually, the way of Jesus is upside down. The real way to follow life, Jesus says, is not to look within, but to look outside and to see what our creator says about us. 
He who really knows. And on the screen, here are just some of the things that he says about his children. You could even take a little snapshot with your phone if it's helpful. He says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The scriptures are there for you. He says that he chose us, such was his love for us. He says that once we've been forgiven and reconciled from our rebellion, we are his beloved sons and heirs with an indescribably rich inheritance. He says that you do have a purpose to your life, that you have good works prepared in advance for you to do, works in which you are appointed to be fruitful in. And you have a great commission to carry out as a royal ambassador in his kingdom. And he says he sings over you, delights in you, and that his love for you, you can never be separated from it. And they're just a few. That's just a few of the things that define what it is to be a follower and a friend of Jesus, a child, an heir of God. And in terms of the application of this message that I trust will live with you this week, a key way to know truth, sorry, a key way to know hope is to live and meditate on these truths. If you want to know hope this week, speak those out. Write them down. Let them renew your thinking. A key way to show hope is to help each other in the family and community of God live in the good of these truths. Christian life is not a single race. We're racing alongside each other, with each other. Help each other. Hey, do you know what? I wonder if you're just believing a bit of a lie at the moment about who God is and who you are. Can I just remind you, actually, who God really is and who you really are? We need each other to be spurred on, exhorted. You can share, show hope by helping each other to live in the good of our identity. And a key way to share hope is to lovingly, gently, humbly challenge this cultural narrative of the day that says that identity is self-actualized or found within. Challenge it. Live and speak a better word. Just to prove that I have interest outside of war and rugby, Taylor Swift, she said this, I know it can be overwhelming. She's a pop star, if you're wondering. I know it can be overwhelming figuring out who to be, but I've got some good news. It's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. I think she's onto something. She's like, initially, of course it's great to look within and decide who I am and how I should live. Of course it looks great. Amazing. Cast off the restraints of life. Hmm. And then I do, the, I do look within. And I don't like everything that I see. And I realize that my emotions and my feelings and my convictions do fluctuate and change along with the circumstances around me. And if I have to decide who I am, that's terrifying. So we have a great message to share. You can find a secure identity that will not fluctuate and change because of how you feel or how circumstances go. It's available when your creator speaks truth and life over you and that's where life is to be found. Let's not be embarrassed about that, folks. That's a way to share hope with your work colleagues and your friends. Yeah, our secondary identities are important. You might be a mum. You might be a single person. You might be a married person. You might be a same-sex attracted person. You might be a businesswoman. You might be a, a teacher, whatever. But a follower of Jesus, all of those things come secondary to our primary identity in Christ. That defines who we are and how we live and follow him. The way to live free is to know your enemy, know yourself. And, of course, to know Christ. Finally, know Christ, his tools and his victory. Know Christ, his tools and his victory. Look at the way Jesus navigated his way through this challenge. First of all, he's led by the Spirit. You notice that? And led into a time of prayer and fasting. Maybe you are too, this Lent season. Being led into a time of prayer and fasting. One of our life groups down the road in Molesy, they're doing a, a digital fast. They've got lots of pregnant mums or mums-to-be, so fasting for food isn't straightforward. They're doing a digital fast this Lent. Why? Not because tech is bad, but because they want to put things to, good things to one side to focus on the main thing to open their hearts, to create time and space during this season. Secondly, Jesus doesn't just 
He's not just led by the Spirit, he knows his identity, as we've just been saying. And he and he, we submit our secondary identities to the primary identity of what, who God says we are. And thirdly, he knows the word of God. Did you get that? It is written. It is written. It is written. I submit to you that if Jesus took time to know the word of God and to speak it out, then maybe that's our calling as well. We actively resist the enemy. We actively resist him. We don't go passive and say, oh, this is just how things is. We use the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and we resist him and his lies, and he has to flee, which is what James says. Guys, we don't have to be mastered by sin. You don't have to go through the rest of this year, the rest of your life, carrying those things that just hinder us. You don't. There is hope this morning. Not least because we have the same weapons at our disposal to fight. The same weapons that Jesus had, we have. Led by the Spirit, the Word of God, identity, and many others. So fight. Fight to live free. But, and here is where hope ultimately lies. And if you hear nothing else this morning, I'd ask you to hear this. Ultimately, hope lies not because Jesus is our perfect example to emulate, but because he is our victory to enjoy. Okay? I'll say it again. Ultimately, Jesus is not our perfect example to simply emulate. He is our victory to enjoy. He has done these things, not just so that he could show us how to, but so that he could empower us to. He is our victory. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So what you see Jesus doing in Matthew 4, <clears throat> excuse me, is a foretaste, a foreshadow of what he does at the cross when he decisively defeats the power of sin, Satan and death and if you trust in him and you're united to him he applies the benefits of that victory to you so you don't leave this room please think I've got to try harder to be like Jesus no, receive his victory this morning he's done it on your behalf if you believe in him, you died with him you've been raised to newness of life for him ready to run hard and free after him empowered by the Holy Spirit I really want you to encourage you to ultimately trust in the fact that he has won this victory for you. You're on the winning team. In my rugby analogy, I was on the winning team. I forgot I had an enemy. I forgot that I was weak. But also I forgot we are winning and we are going to win. If I have a shocker, we, we still would have won that game. 60-0. That win was guaranteed. And it's the same for a Christian. You are on the winning team. So live in the good of that this week. The way to live free is to know your enemy, know yourself, and know Christ.